Good Friday morning. This is a powerful text from St. John. Again, it's again, it's his first letter, okay? But, but watch, he moves from love to life. Watch him make this move. He said, who indeed is the victor over the world? You have to understand what he means by world are the forces of division and death. He does not mean this earth. Unfortunately, it was interpreted that way, especially by the monks. Oh, God, 1,500 years ago, okay? Fogamundi, flee the world, flee the world, manning the, the, the things of this world. That's an extreme version of it. We are not dualists. We're not Greek dualists. To see, that was Greek philosophy. Where you got to read Plato to get the full force of that, okay? Where we're separatists in which we see only heaven matters. That's not true. We are incarnationalists in the fullest sense of the word, okay? As Christians, all right? So the world means the power of evil, the power of self-destructive evil. Separate. If you want to say another word for it, the devil. The world is the power. When he says world, he means the power the antithesis of the divine, the opposite of the divine, the opposite of love. It's hate, division, death. That's what he means by it, okay? It doesn't have anything to do with Mother Earth, okay? So this is what he says. I'll show it to you. It's not hard to see it, okay? Who indeed is the victor over the world, over the powers of divisiveness, evil, and death, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Belief, okay? Belief in Jesus, remember? Okay, this is the one who can now watch this. This is John with the vengeance. Now think of Good Friday. Think of the Gospel of John where Christ is on the cross dying, okay? This is the one who came through water and blood. Remember what came from Christ's side? Water and blood, baptism in the Eucharist. Jesus Christ, not by water alone, not see, not by, not by um, baptism alone, but by water and blood, the Eucharist. The Spirit is the one who testifies, and the Spirit is truth. So there are three who testify. The Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, we have no belief. The water, baptism, and the blood, the Eucharist. And the three are of one accord. If we accept human testimony, the testimony of God is surely greater. Now the testimony of God is this, that he has testified on behalf of his Son. Think of this. What happens on Good Friday? It's the moment of complete revelation, okay? When Christ dies on the cross in John's gospel. That's why John's a genius. You want to understand Christianity, you ought to start with John and read it backwards. Okay? Whoever believes in the Son of God has this testimony within him. Whoever does not believe God has made God a liar by not believing the testimony God has given about his Son if you reject the cross of Christ. And this is his testimony. God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever possesses the Son has life. And whoever does not possess the Son of God does not have life. Boy, do I, that is, you've got to be old for that. That one you have to be, you have to feel the passage of life to understand the full force of what he just said there. And it seems to me to be absolutely true. As you get older, as I am, you feel the finitude of life and the passage of time. And you move from, and in a sense, not a naive, but a simplistic view of tomorrow. Well, we'll be around tomorrow. To recognition, there are very few tomorrows left. And that's the beginning of wisdom. You begin to appreciate life profoundly. And you realize how finite it is. And that's the birth of religion. Because now you seek life without boundaries, without passage, without grief, without sorrow. You seek life free of the passage of time, the perishing of time. You begin to, that's when the mystery of the cross is so powerful. Christ dies triumphantly on the cross. He overcomes death on the cross itself. He gives birth to the church. It's an action. When Christ dies, that's an action. He's not passive. Out of his side, out of his side comes the creation of the church and life forever. It's interesting, too, because he dies not only by the Romans, but by a spear in his side, by, by the, in a sense, the pagan world, becomes it as it were the final, the, the, the co-witness with Mary, John, and the other Marys. It was the soldier who ran his side, who put the spear into him, the lions, see? It's interesting, isn't it? The world came together on, on Good Friday. That's John with a vengeance, see?
he who believes. And the, the cross of Christ, Christ on the cross, is the life source, a life that transcends death. And I have to say that means a tremendous amount to me now as I feel so deeply within myself the passage of life. Now, maybe I've never had such a deep, intuitive sense of life, its beauty, its goodness, and its passage. You know, that's the truth. I'm not pessimistic or anything I'm not like that. I'm just aware. And when you think of Christmas and you think of New Year, the epiphany, it's the awakening constantly of, how, of hope, of life over death, light over darkness. The days get longer, you see. It's a natural feast in the sense the days get longer, you know. Light over dark. You think it's an accident that they put Christmas on the 25th? <laughs> it's, it could have been the 22nd or 21st of December. It's, it's the days get longer. It's a natural symbol of Christ rising from the dead. The birth and, and, and rising, resurrection. You can't understand Christmas without, without understanding in the light of Easter, the, good, the Paschal mystery. <laughs> we can't. We can't. It's not just a holiday. It's, it's the first step in the great, the great revelation of God's light and wisdom overcoming darkness, death, and, and uh, unwisdom, the foolishness of the world, in John's sense, the world. Mm -hmm. That's neat. That's why this time of year is a sacred time, is a reminder. The great feast days remind of that God came in the flesh to us in order to free us from the bondage of flesh, the bondage of time, mm -hmm. to free us. And it is a freedom to know that death is not final, that darkness is not the final reality, that light is. Light conquers darkness. Life conquers death. Christ conquers the world, as it were, the forces of evil and division. When I think of paradise, I think of being with my family again, with my friends, with Junie, with all whom I have loved and been loved by. In a common dinner, I think of my father's dinners at Christmas, a dinner where there are no arguments, none allowed, <laughs> nor desired, where friends and relatives sit at the table forevermore. You had to be there to appreciate it, to understand the imagery of that kind of dinner. That is the primordial ecclesial dinner in paradise, the church in paradise. It's a dinner. In a sense, it's the primordial and most perfect Eucharist, a thanksgiving of love together in paradise, because Christ in the incarnation and his death on the cross conquered the world. He conquered death. He conquered all that makes us separate and sorrowful, giving us the fullness of hope in life. When so many of my very, very good friends have left the faith, I wonder what they cling to when life, when the passage of life is so overwhelming. What happens? You just say, well, that's it. She wrote no more. Okay. I can understand that and accept it to a degree, but I can't really. You have to shut your heart off. And even your mind, even your mind. And I'll tell you for one last thing, because without Christ and the cross, without the, the Paschal mystery and the eternity that comes with it, there is no justice in life. And the reason for that is this, because the suffering of the innocent